Makes sense. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a great lunch. Awesome. Everyone's like talking a little bit more now. I like that. It was too quiet this morning. All right. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Rachel, who's going to get us started. Hello. I'm Rachel Vellani. I am a junior at Santa Clay High School, and I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Rachel Litt. Um, there are so many great things about Rachel Litt. Rachel is the Youth Arts Coordinator for the Climate Museum based in New York City, which is the first of its kind in the U.S., whose mission is to inspire climate action um, through arts and science. Uh, Rachel is the point of contact for the museum's Youth Arts Climates Program. She is passionate about education and believes that museums can be a force of justice. She earned her undergraduate degree at Sarah Lawrence College and is interested in accessibility and museum education, areas in which she has conducted research and plans to continue. Lastly, one of the best parts about Rachel is her first name. Um, please welcome, please join me in welcoming Rachel Litt. Thank you for that introduction. I've also been told I have a really fun last name as well. It's pretty lit, I know. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, that works too. I'll just not, yeah, double it up. Okay, well, hi everybody. How's everyone doing? How are we enjoying this summit so far? Great? Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for having me here, especially thank you to the Wild Center for inviting me here and also for inaugurating um, Youth Climate Summits 11 years ago. It's incredible to hear that this is the 11th year this has been going on. I'm fairly new to youth climate work myself. I'm still within my first year of working in it, but I'm so glad to know that it has a much deeper history than I anticipated it did already. 
But like I said, um, I work at a place called the Climate Museum, which is located in New York City, which I will talk about a little bit in a bit. Um, but here today, I am going to talk to you about the arts and why they're important, not just in general, but specifically within the climate movement and the youth climate movement. So being a youth arts coordinator, <coughs> thank you. Um, Basically what I do is I design and run programs for young people like yourselves to get involved with the climate movement in creative ways. Um, and I just try to facilitate programs that people present to me as well as de designing ones that I come up with myself. That's mostly because I believe in the power of both young people and the arts to start social movements and to generate change. And so starting off our art talk, I'm going to point out two pieces that we have up here. The one, the one on the bottom, where you see sort of this person hugging a tree, um, is called Puliki, which is Hawaiian for embrace. Um, it was done in 2017 by an artist named Hula on fire damaged trees in a remote forest. Um, and Hula is actually someone named Sean Yor, who works under the name Hula, and wanted to use natural chalk pigment to create a temporary mural on fire damaged trees that kind of shows the fragility and tenderness um, between the natural world and people. Um, and it's trying to emphasize humanity's embrace to protect nature in the face of climate change. And then on the top, we have a piece by the artist David Opdyke that was actually done earlier this year in which he assembled 528 different postcards from across the US, mostly from places like national forests, um, national parks, um, that kind of had this nostalgic feel to them. They almost looked like something that you would have gotten on vacation in the 60s to bring home. And what he did was he took the images in them and shifted them to show what would happen to these places after the effects of climate change take place. So some of them show tornadoes in cities, um, rivers choked with algae, lightning, wildfires, floods, desertification in abandoned towns, frozen orange groves, invasive vines that are crushing buildings, and hundreds of crows that are flying over fields of shriveled corn. And then you can see that he arranged them so that they would fall away at the bottom, which is to show that all of these things will happen and then our world will crumble. So like I said, I work at the Climate Museum, which is the first museum in the US dedicated to climate change. Um, we were founded in 2015 and have been doing programming since December of 2017. And we try to use the arts and sciences together to bring about just solutions. We're very focused on climate justice as well as solutions. And that's mostly because we are trying to break the climate silence. Um, according to studies from Yale and a report from George Mason University in December 2018, 69% of people in the U.S. are worried about climate change, but only 8% are reported to be talking about it more than occasionally. And that's a really big disparity, 69% to 8%. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to engage all those people that are somewhere between the 8% and the 69% who are already aware of this issue and who are already concerned but aren't really thinking about it on a daily basis or talking about it. And we're also very aware of trying to stay in touch with the youth movement because we realize that young people are the ones who are going to bear this burden the hardest and for the longest and that we need to be listening to the people who this is going to affect the most. Um, technically, we don't have a physical space yet, but we are a museum. Um, we do programming out of Governor's Island, which is a small island in between Manhattan and Brooklyn, for six months out of the year. And so in the top photo on the left, you can see our first exhibition that we did, which was called In Human Time. Um, In Human Time showcased the works of two artists. One was Zaria Foreman and the other was Peggy Wheel, and explored the relationships between humans, time, and ice. So the first part um, was working with Zaria Foreman, and it was put on at the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center at the Parsons School of Design in New York City. And Zaria Foreman is a painter and drawer, um, and we displayed a reproduction of her painting Whale Bay, Antarctica, and a time-lapse video depicting her painting the piece. Um, in this specific piece, 
shows ice formations in Whale Bay, Antarctica, and the way that they are changing due to various wind patterns and uh, warming temperatures. And the second part of the exhibition was with um, Peggy Wheel, who is a documentary filmmaker, in which we showed the film 88 Cores, um, which was shown for the first time, actually, as part of this exhibition. The film takes the viewer down through two miles of ice um, in the Greenland ice sheet in one continuous pan and shows over 110,000 years in time. We were also able to show still images of the ice, which you can see here, um, and got to have a lot of great school groups come and educate them about ice core science um, and what ice core science can tell us about climate change over time. We've also had, um, like I said, exhibitions on Governor's Island. One of them, our first one, was what we called the Climate Museum Hub, which we did um, kind of in response to a public art piece that I'll talk a little bit more about later, um, in which we let people make their own versions of a public art installation that we did called Climate Signals. Um, it was also just a chance for us to be able to educate people a little bit more about the museum, as well as showcase 11 different New Yorkers um, through portrait photography who are leading the city forward on climate. And our most recent exhibition was called Taking Action. You can see a still from it in the bottom there. Um, and Taking Action focused on climate solutions, why these solutions are not being enacted at the moment, and the actions we can all take to advance these just solutions. Um, and basically, we tried to present various solutions that are happening um, throughout New York City that are proven climate solutions by trying to make it very place-based um, since our main audience were people within New York City. Um, and we all also wanted to show, unfortunately, some of the reasons that these places, uh, these solutions are not being implemented, such as major banks investing in um, oil and the lack of talk about climate in mainstream media. Um, but then we also wanted to end our exhibition on an actionable note. So you can see in this um, image, it's actually the picture of our action room in which we asked visitors to commit to taking a climate action. We made them very simple um, things that people could definitely do. One of them was talk to three people that you know about climate change. And another one um, was writing a letter to your bank asking them to divest from oil. Um, we asked people to write down their emails on an iPad, and we also gave them a sticker um, that corresponded to whatever action they pledged to take, and then we had an action wall in, that was covered with stickers. And the reason we had that action wall was to show people that they were not alone in thinking about this, and they were not alone in wanting to take action, and that there are so many other people already who are taking action and are committing to it. And the reason that we took people's emails was because then we would send them a follow-up email with reminding them what they committed to doing, and giving them instructions on how they can do that. Making sure that they follow up, sort of like your climate action plans that you're going to create and bring back to your schools. And so the youth movement. I don't really need to talk to you guys that much about it because you are the youth movement. And we just try to listen to you as much as we can. This is a still that was sent in to us. Um, for some of the promotion for the climate strike that happened in September. Um, and I'm sure you all are very familiar with the work of Greta Thunberg and other youth, um, youth leaders throughout the world um, and how much they are starting to talk about, I shouldn't say starting, actually have been talking about climate. And we found that the best way for people to communicate on climate is just to simply start with talking. Um, it can be as simple as talking to someone on the bus that you ride with, talking to a family member, and making sure that it's a meaningful conversation. It's not just saying like, oh yeah, it's a little warmer out than it used to be. Making sure that you've done your research, um, you are informed, and that you really are being an advocate for climate. And you can see this already at protests, on Twitter, in your own homes, I'm sure. But, like I said before, I'm here to talk to you about the arts, specifically. So we've got a few different examples here. Um, in the center, on the top, you can see a sculpture um, that was created by an artist and hung on a gallery wall. You can also see a dance piece in motion, photography. The bottom center is actually a quilt. Um, and then we have a print on the bottom left. In the top right, we have a music piece. 
Um, and when I say arts, I'm talking about anything creative, really. Music, theater, dance, painting, drawing, creative writing, sculpture making, photography, mural painting, quilting, sewing, fashion, even. All of these things are valuable ways of communicating climate. Anything that you find you are passionate about and you can include climate in is valuable. And so in the top right, we have, a sorry, on the top left actually, um, we have a photo of a piano in the middle of an iceberg almost. This was actually um, a project called LG for the Arctic that was put on by Greenpeace in 2016, in which they hired Italian composer Ludovico Einaudi um, to create a song for the Arctic. And then they created this floating raft and set him adrift outside of an iceberg, um, the Wallenberg Breen Glacier in Svalbard, Norway, and asked him to perform the piece. Um, I highly encourage all of you to go find it on YouTube. It's incredible. There's also a short documentary about how they had this happen. Truly incredible. It's an extremely moving piece. Um, Ludovico Einaudi did not have that much experience in climate previously, at least to the public's knowledge. Um, and it's extremely moving to watch and to hear, especially because if you watch it, you can see ice falling around him as he's playing. And it truly is an elegy for the Arctic. But why is art important? Besides just being something fun that we all enjoy, it really it does have a place within culture, within society. Everybody likes something creative. Everyone likes some form of creativity and art, and that's why they're so effective. Can I just get a show of hands for somebody who considers themselves to be an artist in any way? OK, there's plenty of you in here. Good. But I bet that it's actually even more than that. Because by nature, humans are creative creatures. And we're also emotional creature creatures. And art appeals to emotions, something that we all feel and that we can all connect on. And the great thing about emotions is that you don't have to be a climate scientist to understand them. It's awesome that we have our basis from this morning of how to talk about climate change and the science behind it. But a lot of people aren't going to fully understand that when you try to talk to them. Some people are even going to be resistant because they will try to be a climate denier and they will say that you have false information. But if you try to appeal to their emotions, you might be able to get through. Art is also a communal experience. When you're viewing it, listening to it, tasting it, hearing it, smelling it even, you're usually doing it with someone else. That's another great thing about museums. You're going there and you're seeing people who are like-minded and who also want to be there and want to learn. And it lets us know that we're not alone. And this is not only our actions. Art is also attention grabbing and it can make people listen to you, especially if they're resistant to talk. And if you're trying to get a point across, sometimes people might want to listen to a piece of music rather than hear your words or maybe they'll listen more intently to song lyrics than to a speech. It's just who they are. Don't blame them for it. Also, the art is intellectual. There's so many different kinds of knowledge and different kinds of smart that people just disregard because it's not academic. But art is intellectual. You have to think about it in order to create it. You have to have some sort of intention. And once you've created it, usually you're not done with it. You're refining it. You're workshopping it, you're redoing it. It's a cognitive thing. And it's valuable. And it's also a form of self-expression, which is incredibly valuable. Because if we're all able to put out that self-expression, that's individual action, and all of that together will create collective action, which is what we need to solve this crisis. Sometimes art, though, can have dark or negative views. And it can seem scary, it can seem hopeless. But the thing is, it's inherently creative and creativity is inherently optimistic. We need all forms of action in order to tackle this crisis. So if you find that you're an artist or if you're interested in it, or even if you think you're bad, I promise you, you're probably not. And you can try this um, and you can help move forward this movement.
So before, I referenced one of our exhibitions, Climate Signals. Um, this was a public art project that we did in New York City in which we programmed highway signs, those things that you see saying road work ahead that we all ignore, um, to have different climate messages. And we spread them across the five boroughs in New York City and Governor's Island. We had 10 different signs rotating through different climate messages um, in both English and Spanish across the city. We also had some other ones that were in different languages depending on the dominant language spoken within a neighborhood. Um, all of these signs were also solar powered, fun fact. Um, and part of the great thing about this um, exhibition was that it was public, so it had a really wide reach and it was really accessible to people. We put them up in places like major parks, um, along various roads. Um, you can see one in Corona Park in Queens with, at the World Fair site. Um, places that people would already be and I was able to spark conversation from that. So some of the places we put them um, were Governor's Island. That's the one that says fossil fueling inequality. We put it there because in the background you can see New York City's financial district. Very powerful political statement right there. Um, we also put them in places that were um, specifically at risk for climate change in the near future, such as Hudson River Park, um, which is the one in the top middle that says no icebergs ahead. Um, we also put them in centers um, that have a lot of environmental justice movements, such as, such as Sunset Park and Hunts Point. Um, we put one in the Rockaways, which is in a community that was heavily affected by Hurricane Sandy. Um, and we wanted, we picked all of our sites spe for specific reasons, either for visibility, such as high foot traffic, or because of the environmental justice groups that were there. And with each sign, we made a partnership with a local community organization um, in that area to spark um, dialogue around these signs, as well as reach um, support our outreach. Um, like I said, they rotated through cycles of about 10, so I tried to include as many of them in here as I can and climate justice, climate change at work, abolish coal, onealism, my personal favorite one, fossil fueling inequality, no icebergs ahead, alt facts, and now I've got more here. Um, you can see the ones that were put up in Chinese and Russian, um, as well as one in Spanish here. Um, and fun fact about the Chinese and Russian ones, these signs had never been programmed before in non-Latinate alphabets, so we had to hand paint each pixel to make it work, took a lot of work. But one of the most common ways of seeing climate art is signs at marches. So raise your hand if you've been to a climate march or protest or strike or whatever, most of you. Yeah, it's okay if you haven't too. And raise your hand if you've had a sign with you. Fairly similar number, okay. So the great thing about uh, climate marches is that there's so many people who are there for the same reason in one space. And a lot of people feel the need to have signs because they wanna get their message ahead if they can't talk to someone or just because they like it. So some of the things you can see here are um, this hat um, was with made by someone who marched with us at the climate strike in September. Um, she said it was made for Greta and was inspired by her quote of our house is on fire. Um, you can also see a sign made for the zero hour march that took place in New York City um, over a year ago in which you can see an, el an earth sort of melting down. Um, this is the last straw was also at the climate strike um, in September. Um, you see another zero hour sign um, you can also see a sign in Spanish showing that art can be intersectional and can be multi-layered and can also appeal to various audiences and it doesn't have to be something that you can explicitly read. You can just look at it and understand it. I personally don't speak Spanish, but I get it. I understand. And two of these signs, uh, both of the zero hour signs, were actually made in an event that we held before the zero hour march in which we had community art making in Washington Square Park because art is a community experience um, in which we just supplied um, posters, spray paint, paint brushes, crayons, markers, and just put out a general call to the public that if you wanted to make a sign for the march that was happening the next day, you could come. 
And we got a lot of great people who came and had a lot of awesome conversations and then marched with us the next day. And a lot of them are still involved with the museum to this day. And so Climate Speaks. Um, Climate Speaks is a program run by the Climate Museum that was started in January 2019. Um, it's our creative writing and performance program, which I'm actually running this year. Um, the way that Climate Speaks works is it's sort of a competition, sort of not. So basically it starts out with workshops. Anyone in the New York City area who is a high school student is eligible to come to the workshops. One of them teaches you about climate education and one of them teaches you about creative writing. Once you've come to those workshops, um, last year we held them in for the five borough. This, this upcoming year, they will be in all five boroughs. Um, you're eligible to submit an original writing piece to continue to become a semi-finalist. Um, once you become a semi-finalist, if you're accepted, you get all sorts of performance workshops, work, um, help from teaching artists, help um, who are also there to mentor you. Um, and then you can audition to become a finalist. The finalists are given even more performance workshops, um, are given even more mentoring, even more time with the teaching artists, and then are presented, um, presenting their poems in a final performance at the end of the program. And so we were lucky enough that in our first year we were able to get 14 truly incredible people who came um, and were, um, wrote their own poems and presented them on the stage of the Apollo Theater in Harlem, which is a fairly historic theater if you haven't heard of it. Um, and these people, most of them actually did not have any experience with poetry when they started out. Some of those who did, didn't have experience with climate. Um, and all of them turned into these truly incredible performers um, who I'm so proud to still know to this day, this day. Some of them got involved with other groups such as Fridays for Future or Urban Word NYC, which is a poetry um, advocacy group in New York City. We're going to be running the program again in 2020, so if anybody here um, is within the New York City area or can find themselves getting into New York City on a regular basis, please apply, please come to the program. Completely free, also. Um, no experience is necessary, also. Um, but if you can't, you can come to my workshop, which is directly after this, which is basically going to be a shortened version of one of the workshops. And yeah, so what can you do? Well, what do you like to do? Lots of you already said that you're artists in some ways. Some of you said that you're not, and that's okay. You're probably artists in some ways. Basically, you can follow your creative pursuits. You can make art, music, theater, dance, creative writing, poetry, drawing, painting, sculpture, photography, mural making, fashion, all those things that I said before, quilt making, anything else. You can also support art if you don't feel that you want that to be your mode of climate advocacy. Basically, in general, we just need a lot more climate art. We need ways to connect with people, to start more conversations, to build more community, and to have people express their values and express their ideas and come up with new solutions. Art can be part of solutions. Um, if you want to see more climate art, you can follow the Climate Museum on Instagram. Every Tuesday and Friday, we have a series called Pathways to Climate that comes out and that features a different piece of climate art um, and gives you links so that you can learn more about it. Um, like I said, if you're in the New York City area, you can get involved with the Climate Museum. Or if you just want to talk um, about bringing climate arts to your community, I would love to talk with anyone about that. Um, you can create art, like I said before. And I also wanted to remind everybody that all great social movements have generated art in some way. There's so many different musical pieces that came out of the civil rights movement. Um, there's many different um, murals that came out of the anti-war movements that are truly breathtaking. Basically, we need our source of art for this movement. So I actually wanted to close um, with reading one of the poems from Climate Speaks 2019 that was written by a student named Eliza Schiff, 
who was a senior in high school at the time, and now she is a freshman at Reed College in Oregon. And her poem is called Offbeat. I didn't know wind could scream. I'd heard it whisper, coo, call out to the world, even cry, but never in all its ever presence did I hear it scream. Not until the sky was green and stale as if the blue I knew like the creases of my mother's eyes, like the twirl of my brother's hair, had never, never painted the world above and I had never stared up at it. Lost. The wind scream and power lines broke. Branches broke windows broke. The perfect stillness I always knew of the night broke. And I thought for a time maybe I broke too. I wanted to see it, to look out of the window as rain fell or maybe rain took. To look out and brace the storm sung by satellites and weather balloons in Channel 4 that sent us undercover left us wrecked, crying out to our earthly mother fallible and delicate and defeated just like Hannibal, our waiting has made an Icarus out of animals. I've heard a band play it along as the Titanic went down, a sad and mournful tune as hope ran aground. Now our ship is sinking, our world is burning, our cities languish as they gasp for air, but who is dancing to this melody? Is it you, Charles and David Koch? who sit behind a desk in an office holding back the remedy? You, idols of the older generation who sit with the blinds drawn shut, is that why you can't hear the wind screaming? Or maybe is it that you won't hear the wind screaming? But me, we, us, we have grown weary of this worn out beat, this wreckage waltz. It forever could be measured by the meter of your music, and if your music was the ricochet of they will fix it some other day. Or the piercing cacophony of DC and CFO and BP and tired greed, you're counting in fours, and we can't stomach it anymore. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's the sound of drilling and pumping and filling and dumping. CO2 in the air that promised us the air we breathe. It's the sound of storm surges clawing at the only home we've ever known, the neglect of a planet whose life you bemoan. This is the silence of change that has left us weeping in vain, not the absence of noise, but the screaming quiet of climate science. Silence. Quiet compliance. Hear us now congregated and aggravated and syncopated. Our beat is not like that of the past. We're dancing to the tune of resolve at last and it sounds like you and me and us and now. You and me and us and now. Thank you very much. And so I have time for a few questions, if anybody has any. Sure. Um, so I was actually not around at the time of Climate Signals, um, but there was a partnership with the New York City Depot, um, Office of Sustainability and the Mayor's Office. Um, so I imagine it was most likely through them, but there was, um, as well as a partnership with New York City Parks and Recreation. There, is there a plan to have a physical building where the Climate Museum is, or is it like a conceptual museum like forever? Um, the, so we're considering it. Um, I'd say it's not necessarily a priority at the moment because we're much more focused on keeping our public programming going and making sure that we can continue doing outreach, building lots of great partnerships, um, like with the Wild Center, um, and making sure that exhibitions that we put on are good and actionable. A 
Okay, well, thank you all very much. Thank you so much to Rachel, and um, I hope you're all feeling inspired to write some climate poetry. Um, we have about 10 minutes or so. The next workshops start at 1.